Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salam, Allah Rasulillah, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahmi Wa Ala Ama Ba'd, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Wa Barakatuh. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. So last week we talked about the question that uh, was burning in the mind, which was what is the connection between the blessings that Allah Ta'ala is listing here? Obviously when Allah says, I blessed you with all kinds of food, Allah could have listed any food. Allah could have said, I blessed you with, I don't know, mangoes and, <laughs> you know, uh, apples and oranges, etc. Allah could have mentioned anything. Why these, why these ones? That's, that was the question. And I even admitted last week, I said, you know, to be perfectly honest, I tried to do research and I felt that I fell short. I, I really didn't feel that I had something really solid. Alhamdulillah, this week I have something that I do think, inshallah, and of course there could be multiple interpretations, but one thing that I think is um, significant is the connection here. To understand the connection between these different foods, we have to first take a look at what is the overall theme of the surah and see how it fits in. So what is the overall theme of the surah? Well, when you look at ayat 1 to 10, Allah Ta'ala is talking about, well, I, I would say the, the, the answer to that question in all answers is what? How can you be proud? This is the big question in the whole surah. How can you be proud? So now let's get into it. Ayat 1 to 10 talk about the disbeliever who's delusional. He's arrogant for no reason. And then there's the believer who recognizes his own humility. So both of them should have the believer who's humble, that's good, he, he's not proud. And the disbeliever, he's arrogant, but delusionally. That's ayat one through 10, roughly speaking. I mean, uh, that's generally the, the concept here. So this idea of what are you proud of? How can you be proud? Then uh, from ayat 11 to 16, Allah talks about revelation, how it is from way above. It is with the angels, and it is unreachable to human beings unless Allah Ta'ala sends it to you. So what can you be proud of? You're completely misguided until I send you something from way above you that you cannot reach. So SubhanAllah, what are you proud of? Then you have the next section from 17 to 23. Allah Ta'ala is saying, look at where you came from and look at where you're going. You came from a sperm drop. Is that something to be proud of? You're going into your grave, right? Uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala mentions the nutfa and then what? Uh, uh, then you're going to die and I'm going to put you into a grave. And then anshara, then I'm going to resurrect you. You're not going to have any choice in the matter. I'm just going to take you out whenever I want. And you're still ungrateful. That's how I was mentioning. How incredible that you, you disbelieve after all this has been demonstrated. And Allah Ta'ala also finishes by saying what? You're not even trying to do what you're not even trying to accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish. So again, what are you proud of? So when you look at this consistency, then you get to this section, which is ayah 24 to 32, where Allah is saying, look at your food, look at how I send down the rain, look at how it splits the earth, and now take a look at these different foods. And the question is, how can you be proud when your food is the same as your cattle? In the sense that Allah Ta'ala starts with what? Well, first of all, the rain, we, we're all sitting around for the rain. We, 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 we couldn't make, let's say, the salt water uh, beneficial for the earth. If Allah Ta'ala didn't bless us with this water, we couldn't transport all that water, we would eventually starve and die, right? The fact that Allah evaporates it, brings it over, sends it down as crops, just like the animals, we're equally just sitting around waiting for the rain to come down. Then when it splits the earth and comes up, it's the same for all of us, us and for our cattle. And then Allah Ta'ala, habba, grain. Grain is something that we share. We can eat it and our cattle can eat it as well. This is split. Usually you find grapes is more of a luxury for humans and then uh, uh, herbage is more for the animals. This one's really interesting. This one also puzzled me. What, what's the connection here? Both of them have pits. Zaytun is an olive, right? You, we as humans eat the flesh around it and same thing with the date. We eat the flesh around it. But they both have pits. And guess what? Both pits can be ground up and fed to the... Uh, to the uh, cattle, subhanAllah. So again, there's a connection with the animals. Uh, 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 and when it comes to your gardens, when I was wondering, what is the connection here? Why do you create a garden? Why do you fence off? A uh, hadiqa is a fenced off garden. Why is it fenced off? So the animals don't come get it. Again, you guys are sharing with your animals to the point that you guys have to fend them off and say, okay, look, I need to protect this because they're gonna come take our, our food. Maybe the sheep are gonna come, maybe the goats are gonna come. I have to protect. You, how are you proud when you're eating the same stuff as your sheep and your goats and you guys are fighting each other, putting up fences to make sure, no, this is for me and this is for you. And then of course, when it comes to fruits and the grass, the fruits is for us and the grass is for them. And then Allah Ta'ala makes it very clear, this is food for you, this is a, a, a benefit for you, or you can say mata' is more like a, a tool or a benefit or a sustenance or something you can benefit, uh, enjoy for you and for your cattle. So subhanAllah, this connects all of them together and I think this is a good explanation inshallah ta'ala. 
Now we can go on to today's talk, inshallah. It might be a bit long, I apologize. I'm going to try to finish the surah here, inshallah. Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَ Now after mentioning all of this dunyawi food, this, that, and the other, don't you benefit from these blessings? Now Allah Ta'ala says, then when comes the deafening blast, blast. سخ يسخ سخا فهو صاخ means what to make a deafening noise by striking something so hard like cracking a rock imagine something like a big boulder gets cracked the sound it makes obviously it's going to be incredibly loud it's going to be it's going to shake you to your core it can also mean to hit somebody either on their ear or on their head so hard that it deafens them or it knocks them out it shakes them it rattles them so this is the blast this is what a judgment day is called it's called the deafening blast now, this is paralleled with the previous surah, surah Nazi'at, where surah Nazi'at, this is surah 80, Nazi'at is 79. So what's the ayah that's similar to it? فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الطَّامَّةُ الْكُبْرَى Right, very, very similar wording. And this is in reference to the overwhelming calamity. We're gonna talk about that when we get to that surah, inshallah ta'ala, but there's just an interesting parallel between these two surahs. Why does this surah talk about the sakha in particular? Because it's appropriate, because in this context, the beginning of the surah was talking about the disbeliever who was listening to this da'wah, and he couldn't care less. He was being disrespectful to the Prophet ﷺ. He was treating it like it was a joke. And so, therefore, you're receiving this preaching, you're too proud, too careless, and ultimately not really listening, so Allah is saying what? You may ignore the message now, but, the, but ignoring the sound won't be possible then. On that day, when the deafening sounds, sound comes, you, it will be impossible for anybody to ignore this incredibly loud, deafening sound. It will have such a powerful impact. So that is one concept. And also you could say, you know, even in English you say, I'm putting somebody on blast. And there are three people that feel that they're being put on blast in the surah. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who felt like, oh no, I was interrupting the Prophet Am I being reprimanded? Allah Ta'ala reassures him. No, no, I'm not reprimanding you because you had good intentions. The Prophet was being, Abbasah wa Tawalla, you frowned. So he might feel like he's being put on blast, right? And so he's very nervous. And we know that on Judgment Day, even the MBA will be saying things like, you know, maybe Allah Ta'ala will hold me to account for even the smallest and tiniest infraction that nobody saw, but Allah saw. Because obviously the blind man didn't see him frown, right? So nobody actually saw it, but Allah saw, saw it, the only one who did see it. So you might feel nervous, but of course Allah Ta'ala reassures him and says, no, no, you're, you're, you're you know, he, Allah Ta'ala is not angry at him for this. However, the arrogant one who was being criticized harshly, he is the one that will be put on full blast. And so if all these people think that they're being quote unquote blasted with this surah, just imagine when that day comes, subhanAllah, the fear will be so much more. To what point? Well, how bad will the blast be? Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ On that day, a man will flee. فَرَّ يَفِرُّ فَرًّا or فِرَارًا or مَفَرًّا means what? To flee in terror, to run full sprint, to get, you know when someone's just, eyes are super, super wide, screaming as loud as they can, and they're running full blast, that's فَرَّ يَفِرُّ To run full blast. Why? Because you're terrified. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ He's going to run from his brother. Why? And also, Ammar. Allah could have said Rajul, Allah, Allah could have said Dhakar, the male or the man. Allah, Allah used Mar'u. Mar'a comes from Muru'a. Muru'a means a, like, uh, to be chivalrous. So Mar'un implies like a gentleman. If a gentleman is going to be running like that, imagine everybody else. You know, this is a good man. Uh, so why the brother? Family members are the people we spend the most amount of time with, thus we violate their rights the most often. So the criminal will be terrified of facing all of the infractions they committed against their family members. Perhaps those family members will have to take their hasanat from them or give them their sayyat. They're basically, there's going to be retribution between family members. We violate each other the most and therefore you're going to run from the person. So yes, and also it's fascinating, again, the punishment fits the crime. The wicked don't listen in this life, so they're going to be forced to listen to the blast. And similarly, the wicked just stick to their tribal, to their tribal allegiances in this life. So they'll be running from those same tribal allegiances in the next life. It's subhanAllah, a very powerful combination. The overall message is what? That when people turn their backs on rationality, when you don't listen, when you won't listen and actually consider something, then what do you revert to? You revert to tribalism. This is human nature. You revert to tribalism. Oh, these are, so I'm not actually listening to your argument. I'm just gonna stick with my team. You stick with your team. We won't actually hear each other out and see who has the better argument. Nobody will change their mind because we're too stubborn. And so we are witnessing this type of jahiliya, unfortunately, in our modern day as political polarization becomes more and more, it becomes increased. Echo chambers increase. People only want to hear from their own groups and rational discussion is decreasing. I really, honestly, I blame the news as, I mean, there's many different causes, but it's very sad when you look 30 years ago, 40 years ago at different news anchors. They used to speak, you know, about events 
in a very rational, calm methodology. You know, this is what happened, this is what's going on in this country, in this country, etc. Nowadays, every, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? A news channel is just, a, it's like attitude. They're always interrupting each other. They're always yelling over each other. They're always being rude to each other. And it's like, look, if you guys are the adults, if you guys are the professionals, or if you guys are the rich and the educated, then guess what, what, what type of example are you setting for the kids in high school? I mean, you're acting like high school kids. It's so sad. All of these uh, famous news channels and so forth, sometimes I'm watching them and they're yelling over each other. They don't give each, time to, give each other time to speak. They're always talking over each other in the most arrogant and tribal way. And I'm thinking, you guys are adults? You guys are acting like you're, you're in grade 12, uh, grade uh, you know, 6 or something. It's, it's embarrassing. يَفِرُّ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ he will run from his own mother and his own father, subhanAllah, his own parents. In this life, you think to yourself, oh, I'd rather, I want to die for my parents. I want to sacrifice for myself, myself for my parents. I will go in harm's way for the sake of my parents. And this is a very powerful sentiment. Why wouldn't you want to take on the brunt end of things in the next life? Well, because in, the, in this life, such a sacrifice is a way to pass the test. Whereas in the next life, the test is over. So this idea of like, oh, I'll, I'll take the sacrifice to do the right thing. Why? To pass the test? It's, there's no more test. So, <laughs> and also because in this life, self-sacrifice ends with death. In the next life, there is no end. This idea of I will self-sacrifice for my family, yeah, and then you'll die, and then inshallah you go to the next life. But when you're in the next life, that's it. <laughs> so you go to the fire, that's it. You stay in the fire. And because in this life, you're rewarded for self-sacrifice. In the next life, you're terrified of receiving what you deserve. Right? The idea of saying, I will be the martyr so that I will be get justice on Judgment Day. Well, guess what? That is Judgment Day. That is the justice. And so you want to flee from that justice because you know it's going to be bad. And even his own wife and children. The word wife is a bad translation because zawjah can be wife. Allah said sahiba. What's the difference? Sahiba is like your soulmate. It's like your beloved wife. Because obviously there are some men that are like, oh good, I can get away from my wife. Yeah, you know, <laughs> even if they're like, oh, I'm, I'm happy to get away from my wife, right? Some men might have that attitude. But imagine having this beloved, your soulmate, the one that you love so much. And then on that day, you're even running from her, Wabani and his own children, subhanAllah. Running from your child, it's, uh, that's the worst of the worst. And subhanAllah, everybody will turn into a coward on that day. And what's also very interesting about this, these, this combination, again, the previous section was talking about what? What you eat, look at your food, you eat this type of food, 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 all these different types of foods, right? Well, okay, this section is talking about the different type of people that you would normally eat with. So there's a connection between the two. Talking about food first, and then now Allah Ta'ala is talking about who do you eat with? Your brother, your mother, your father, your wife, your son. These are people that you spend time eating with. And let's say what, these people that you spend so much time with in your household, eating with them, guess what? You're gonna be running, you're gonna be fleeing from them at full speed. Why? For every individual, for every man on that day specifically will be a matter adequate for him. He will be completely sufficed with the matter that he's dealing with. Again, a gentleman, a man with chivalry, and usually such a person would be concerned about others. Oh, somebody fell down, let me help pick them up. You don't care on that day. Everybody's running in their own direction, even for your own kids. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Why? Because they will have this sense of aghuna. It is sufficient for me. It is enough for me. The disbeliever earlier, and again, subhanAllah, there's so many parallels in the surah. Earlier in the surah, anna man istaghuna. He thought he was self-sufficient. He thought that he didn't have to pay attention to anybody because I'm the man. Now you get to find out what it's really like to be so overwhelmed that you can't pay attention to anybody else. So the contrast between this ayah, which is ayah 37, and ayah number 5 is very powerful. The difference between aghna and istighna. Same root letters, but it's just showing between this life and the next life. You thought you were full of yourself and, oh, I have, I'm so busy, I have no time to pay attention to this da'wah. I have no time for anybody else. No, no, now you're, now you're going to find out what it's really like to have no time for nothing. You're going to run because you're petrified. You are completely scared out of your your wits. Yes, and subhanAllah also, uh, there's an interesting parallel in terms of this surah and the previous surah, which is surah Nazi'at. In this ayah, Allah is saying what? Allah is saying that every man will be sufficed for what he is dealing with. But then the question is, well, what is he dealing with? What is he dealing with? Well, the previous surah actually mentioned it. Allah Ta'ala said in surah 79, which is surah Nazi'at, ayah number 35, where Allah says, يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ مَا سَعَى On that day when man will remember what he was hustling for what he was working hard for. So Allah is saying, you will be so preoccupied, you have no time for anybody else. And then if you ask the question, what will I be preoccupied with? Allah already mentioned in the previous surah, you'll be so concerned, what were the things that I was hustling for? Was it just money? Was it just fame? Was it just chasing after my desires? Was it chasing after haram things? What actually kept me up at night? What was actually the thing that I was focused on? That's what you're gonna be so preoccupied with, you won't even have a second to think about your own family members. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. 
Qatada has an interesting perspective. He says that, you know, the, the brother, the two brothers, it's a reference to Cain and Abel. Uh, the mother and the son, it's a reference to uh, the Prophet and his mother, Allah. And this is, seems to be a weak position. The father and the son seems to be Ibrahim and his father. The wife and the husband seems to be a reference to Lut and his wife. And then the son and the father represents Nuh and his son. Allah, and this is, a, 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 you know, a bit of a stretch of a position, but of course it is a, a, a classical position, so it definitely deserves respect. In fact, regarding Pro uh, judgment day, the Prophet ﷺ said something very, very interesting. The Prophet ﷺ says in uh, Sahih Bukhari, uh, that the people will be, ga you people will be gathered on judgment day, barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. So everybody's going to show up barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. Now, obviously, when you think about all of humanity, huge, like the biggest crowd human beings have ever seen, all of humanity being raised together naked, Aisha Allah, she asks a very, you know, natural question, which is what? Ya Rasulullah, ar-rijalu wa nisa'u yanzuru ba'dhum ila ba'd. Are the men and the women going to be staring at each other? I mean, if we're all naked, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty odd. فَقَالَ الْأَمْرُ أَشَدُّ مِنْ أَنْ يُهِمَّهُمْ ذَاكْ That the Prophet says in response to that, the situation will be more severe than for them to pay attention to that. It'll be too intense. So this is a very, very important thing to think about. If Judgment Day is so overwhelming that it's even stronger than the most basic, one of the most basic natural urges, which is the uh, sexual attraction and desires, even that is going to be completely overrun. How preoccupied, how terrified, how fearful must a human being be to not even notice that? And obviously the answer is, subhanAllah, this is why it's called al rashia That's why Judgment Day is called al rashia Why? Because rashia means to cover over. That means it's gonna cover over all your senses. It's gonna cover over desire. It's gonna cover over curiosity. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, good to see you. Hey, what happened to you? I don't care about nothing on that day. Nothing will concern me whatsoever. And also notice how the surah began with the wrong type of motivation to keep company with somebody. Right? And uh, the Prophet was being reprimanded. Why are you giving this respect to this guy just because he has status? Now, of course, the Prophet was trying to give him da'wah, and there's a, we gave a whole explanation about that earlier. But still, being close to somebody for status, that's the wrong reason to be close to them. Now, Allah Ta'ala is talking about what? Being close to somebody just because they're from your tribe, they're from your family, they're from your friends, that's also not the best reason. So what is the right reason? If, this, if the beginning and the end of the surah is talking about all the wrong reasons, what is the right reason? Allah says in Surah Zukhruf, ayah number 67, That close friends on that day will be enemies except those who have taqwa. When close friends have taqwa, then they will be close to each other and underneath the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day. Then, final few ayat. Wujuhun yawma idin musfirah. Faces on that day specifically. Why does Allah do muqaddam? Why does Allah Ta'ala advance the word yawma idin? Specifically on that day. Because in this life, they might not appear, appear to be the best off people. They might appear to be worse off. Sometimes believers have tough times. Sometimes the believers are losing in battle. Sometimes the believers are in poverty. So, but on that day specifically, wujuhun yawma idin musfirah. Asfara yusfiru means to unveil. It means to shine. It means to have achieved something. Achieve your final result. So in other words, Allah is saying that faces on that day, they will be unveiling what is within them, their inner light, that inner iman that's going to finally shine forth. It's going to be exposed. The true faith they had inside is going to shine on that day because they finally achieved what they've been working for, which is towards Allah's pleasure. And this is, by the way, musfira, coming from the same root letters of B.A.D. Safara. B.A.D. Safara, earlier in the surah, ayah number 15, Allah mentioned that the the noble scribes are the angels. So subhanAllah, Allah is using the same, you could say terminology as, because they're why? They're in the same sort of, you could say status or in the uh, paradise with the angels. They will be laughing. And by the way, there's different words for laughing in Arabic. Dahika means to laugh in such a way where it's like really loud. Like, like you know, you open your mouth wide. It's like, like a full blown laugh. Mustabashira means rejoicing at the good news. The Prophet was a Bashir, right? He was the one who gives glad tidings. And Bashara means to peel off. So sometimes you have an inner joy and finally you peel it off and you let out your happiness. So there's two concepts here of Bashara and also Safara. Both of them implying what? That there was this inner Iman, this inner happiness and now gets to be exposed and the believers get to rejoice because that inner light is finally coming out and they can finally uh, go to paradise. And then Allah says what? وَوُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَلَيْهَا غَبَرَةٌ And other faces on that day will have upon them dust. غَبَرَةٌ Why will they have dust on their faces? One answer is because they will be lowly, right? As opposed to the believers who are up on high, 
these disbelievers will be lowly. Obviously, this is close to the dust, so they're going to be covered in dust. That's one way of looking at it. Another perspective is what? Covered in dust means covered in, it's implying like covered in sadness, misery, and worry. But it can also mean that since people are running wild, we said it a second ago, everyone's going to be fleeing from each other, kicking up a lot of dust. And nobody's going to stop to pick somebody up and say, hey, let me help you out, let me wipe you off. No, no, forget about that. We're running completely wild on that day. And so, yes, in this life, the disbelievers have varying beliefs varying values, goals, because they can't unite on one ultimate goal. And so on Judgment Day, this reality is going to be made manifest. Everybody will be running wild in their own directions without considering others just kicking dust up upon each other. So the same reality that is on the inside, that we have different goals and values on the inside, it's all going to be made manifest on Judgment Day. And SubhanAllah, it's like this perfect mirror where you get to see the reality of what was going on. Tarhaquha qatara that this soot or blackness will be covered them. So rahaqa means to forcefully overshadow or to overtake. So what is going to be overtaking or covering them? It's qatara. Qatara means soot or the black smoke from a fire. So why is it the case that this soot will be on their faces? Because they're going to be close to the hellfire. They're going to be close to being pushed in. This is on judgment day. They're going to see the fire getting closer to them. And this is going to be the effect of the fire on them. The soot is going to be affecting them. Ibn Zayd, uh, rahimahullah, he says the difference between ghabara and qatara is that uh, uh, ghabara is what settles from a dust cloud or from smoke or from, from a fire. And uh, qatara is what rises from a dust cloud or from smoke. Or fire. So, so the example, so if I take a bunch of dirt in my hand, right, and I chuck it up into the air, some of it is going to float off as a dust cloud, and some of it's going to fall to the ground. He says that's the difference between what? Ghabara and Qatara. So in a fire, some of the smoke, some of the, like the soot, you'll see it like crackling, and then it'll come down around you, right? Like it'll, things will get covered with this soot and blackness and, and like, uh, what's it called? Like um, embers and stuff like this. Whereas some of it's just going to float up and go. So subhanAllah, whether it be going, coming down or going up, both of them are going to be affecting these disbelievers. Why two lowly substances? Dust represents this dunya. You love this dunya, be covered in the dust. You love this dunya, be covered in this dust. That's for your love of dunya. And as for the soot, it represents the fire. This is for the burning animosity you had towards the truth and their punishment in the hereafter. So the dunya and the akhirah are both being covered here. Ghabara qatara, that's another perspective that I thought was actually quite powerful. So, why is Allah Ta'ala going, going into detail specifically about covering their faces? Well, firstly, because the face represents the honor. And remember, the beginning of the surah was talking about how the Prophet ﷺ was giving them respect, was showing respect to this, these, these, these disbelievers, even though they didn't deserve it. So now Allah Ta'ala is explaining who they really are and what type of treatment their quote-unquote honor really deserves. Sut and this dirt covering their faces. And secondly, because people get dirty because of their environment. Very important point here. People get dirty because of their environment. A person will get covered in dust and dirty uh, because they are in a dirty environment and they'll get covered in soot because they are around a dangerous, fiery, burning environment. And so what is the lesson? Don't be around these losers. Stay away from them and their environment. Stay away from their influence. This is how. This is why the Prophet says what? مَثَلُ الْجَلِيسِ الصَّالِحِ وَالْجَلِيسِ السُّوِي كَمَثَلِ صَاحِبِ الْمِسْكِ وَكِيرِ الْحَدَّادِ that the example of a good companion and a bad companion is like a musk seller and a blacksmith. We all know the hadith. You have a musk seller, you hang out with him, even if you don't get any musk, you're still just gonna smell good by hanging around his shop. As for the blacksmith, you hang around him, then you're gonna get some sort of little embers that are gonna jump and burn your clothes and you're gonna smell like smoke anyhow. anyhow. Last ayah, inshallah, I know I went long today, I apologize, I just want to finish it off. Last ayah, Allah says what? أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَثَرَةُ الْفَجَرَةُ So a few, just two uh, points about this. The word kafir, referring to the ingrate or the disbeliever, that is a reference to your internal state. Fajr is a reference to your external, you're an open sinner, the evil that you do externally, it's your external trait. So these people that are gonna be, have this soot and this, all this grime and they're gonna be in the, in the lowly position, they are indeed the ones who are kafaratul fajara. They are the ones that had kufr on the inside and uh, 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 fujur on the outside. Uh, so they had disbelief and ingratitude internally and they had wickedness externally. So the disbeliever who is rotten both inside and out will be smothered and soot due to the fire. Meanwhile, the, the believer will be unveiling the good they had within them uh, and will be granted the recognition they deserve by Allah Ta'ala, bringing that radiance out for all to see. These two categories were given specific example uh, at the beginning of the surah, right? The blind man and the disbeliever. And now, subhanAllah, the conclusion is coming back to these same two groups and bringing it full circle. And the final point that I want to make is that in Arabic, it's a very interesting language, there are multiple plurals. So in English, you just put an S on the end. There's a book, there's books. You could be referencing two books, 10 books, a million books, doesn't make a difference, just one S, right? In Arabic, there's the word kafir and fajr. 
right? Meaning Catholic disbeliever, fajr, a sinful, open sinner, wicked person. Then there's one plural, which is a little bit smaller, jam'u qillah, smaller plural, which is kafirun and fajirun. Then if you want to get a step higher and a bigger plural, like a larger number, it's kuffar and fujjar. Then if you want the biggest plural, it's kafara and fajara. So here's my question. Why is the biggest plural being used in this ayah? It's the last question of the whole surah, guys. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Yes. Excellent young man, mashallah, takbir. That's exactly right. The reason is because this is judgment day. This is the biggest gathering anybody has ever seen. If you're going to talk about the disbelievers on judgment day, the ones of this generation and the previous one and the one next to them, every generation of disbelievers are going to be there. It's going to be the biggest crowd you ever could ever imagine. This is going to be all of the disbelievers, all of the wicked people. So you're not going to say uh, uh, kafirun or kuffar or fujjar. You're going to say kafara and fajara. So subhanAllah, uh, this just goes to show the eloquence of the Arabic language that it's very, very particular and that Allah Ta'ala obviously puts the exact right words in the right places. And with that, we close. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who can study these surahs appreciate them, memorize them, and live by them, and talk about them, and study them, and understand them, and appreciate them. Jazakum khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.